A listener note, this episode contains adult content and is not suitable for everyone. Please be advised. In the era of the Roman Empire, the provinces under Rome's control were no strangers to capital punishment. In fact, it was common practice for what they deemed the most heinous of crimes. Of course, murder was considered one of the worst, along with robbery and treason. But not all of these crimes led to certain death. If you were an elite, you would likely face a more lenient punishment like exile or a fine. But the crime that almost guaranteed a punishment of death was parricide, the murder of a parent or close family member. The Romans valued two things over all others, the state and the family. They viewed them as parallels to each other. Familial bloodlines determined class and status, which were, at the time, key elements of establishing how society was operated and who could do the operating. By killing someone in your own family, you were destroying the very fabric of Roman society, and they reserved the most brutal methods of the death penalty for anyone who did it. The subject of today's episode, B.J. Liskey, certainly did not view parricide like the Romans did. In 2010, he callously murdered three members of his family in cold blood, including his own father, who so desperately tried to help him as he dealt with a serious mental illness. To BJ, family was not everything. They were pesky weeds that uprooted his life, obstacles that needed to be removed. And that is exactly what he did to them. From Wondery and Tree Fort Media, I'm Candace DeLong, and this is the fourth season of Killer Psyche. For five decades, I studied people's minds through my work as an FBI profiler and psychiatric nurse. I've interviewed countless murderers, including many serial killers. Why did they do it? To get a satisfying answer, we have to dive deep into their minds so that I can give you my best analysis of what made them do what they did. This episode is B.J. Liskey and the Liskey Family Murders. It was the morning of Halloween, 2010, and Devin Griffin was in a rush. After spending the night with his father, the 16-year-old dashed through the driveway of his mother's home in Martin, Ohio, which sat on nearly 100 acres of lush green land in search of a shirt that would be suitable for church that morning. Before he reached the front door, Devin saw his stepbrother, 24-year-old B.J. Liskey, loading unknown items into his father's white Ford truck. In a shock to Devin, B.J. stopped him and asked him what he was doing. B.J. was not the conversational type, and reportedly he was often gloomy and darkish, But for some odd reason, on that particular morning, he was, quote, happier, more upbeat, and more talkative. Devin told his stepbrother that he was going to church and would be back later. He ran inside, changed his shirt, and went off to the service where he sang in the choir. After church, Devin came home and decided to unwind with some video games. He went straight to his room where he played for a few hours. Well into the early afternoon, Devin noticed that the house, which he shared with his mother, stepfather, and biological brother, was eerily quiet. 
He ventured downstairs into the master bedroom. When he stepped inside, he saw his mother, 46-year-old Susan Liskey, and his stepfather, 53-year-old William Billy Liskey, still sleeping in bed. A blanket was pulled up over their heads, and Susan's foot was protruding from the covers. Devin tried to shake his mom awake, but that did not work. He tapped her on her leg, but she just kept sleeping. He tried talking to her, telling her to wake up, but nothing sufficed. Then he pulled back the covers. Devin saw his mother and his stepfather lying in a pool of blood. At first, he thought that this was just a part of some Halloween prank. But when he noticed that neither of his parents were breathing, he quickly realized that this was no laughing matter. They were dead. Devin ran out of the house screaming and sobbing. In a panic, he called his aunt who rushed to come help him. When she went inside to see the scene for herself, spotting her sister and brother-in-law soaked in blood, she immediately dialed 911. Through tears, she told the dispatcher to send police to the home. And without hesitation, she offered up a potential suspect, BJ Liskey. On the phone, she claimed that Billy and Susan, quote, had a lot of trouble with him. That information was passed to the police who arrived at the home soon after. When the police got there, they went inside and found the master bedroom. The scene was gruesome. Billy Liskey was found on the bed in a natural sleeping position with five gunshot wounds in his head and face. Susan was, quote, sprawled more awkwardly, leading investigators to believe that her body had been moved. She was shot three times, all at close range. There were no shell casings on the bedroom floor, leading police to believe that whoever killed the Liskies was careful to cover their tracks. As officers searched the rest of the house, they came across a locked door upstairs. After kicking it down, they quickly realized that they were dealing with a triple homicide. The third victim was Derek Griffin, Devin's 23-year-old brother. He was covered in blood and lying in bed, just like his parents. Derek's injuries were brutal. Instead of being shot by the killer, he had been beaten to death with a blunt force object. Three members of one family were dead, and two of them survived. One of those survivors, Devon, was at the scene and seemed to be terribly distressed. But where was BJ? The search of the family home continued. Several guns were found in the process and they were all seized for testing. Though most of them were used by the family for hunting, authorities took no chances. Eventually, investigators found some promising evidence. First, they found a bloody claw hammer in the home, which they believed was used to kill Derek. Coroners later found that the hammer was consistent with his wounds. Then, after a search of the Liskey family property, they discovered a pond behind the house. That pond had a deck connected to it, and on that deck was a trail of fresh, muddy footprints. Police believed that the footprints were linked to their suspect and that the killer likely dumped the gun used to kill Billy and Susan into the water. But after draining the pond, they could not locate any weapons. By that point, investigators had reason to believe that whoever killed the three victims was familiar with the Liskey family property. Each victim was killed in their own bedrooms and there were no signs of forced entry into the home. When it came to finding a suspect, all eyes were on Devon and his mysterious stepbrother who was nowhere to be found. Devon was questioned by police. He told them about the quick conversation he had with BJ that morning. 
because he was in a rush to head to church, he could not confirm if his slain family members were alive at that time. He also let police know about BJ's odd behavior that morning, how he was for the first time talkative and upbeat. Devin told police that BJ was using his father's truck as they spoke to each other, and he gave them a full description of the vehicle. Devin was officially cleared as a suspect, and the hunt for BJ began. Thanks to the information Devin gave to the police, they learned that the family owned a hunting cabin in Carroll County, about three hours away from the home. Believing that BJ might have fled there, deputies were sent out to the area. Almost immediately, deputies spotted a white Ford pickup truck matching the description Devin provided. They descended on the cabin and found BJ inside, unarmed and calm. He was arrested at gunpoint and did not resist. The news of BJ's arrest shocked the community and local law enforcement too. It marked the first triple homicide case in the area for more than two decades. Even more shocking was BJ's motive, or lack thereof. What could have possibly driven him to kill his own loved ones? And why did he seem so content during his arrest? Police and the public would soon learn that the Liskies were not one big happy family and that BJ was far more disturbed than they could have imagined. William B.J. Liskey was born in Martin, Ohio on November 24, 1985. He was the only child of Billy and Barbara Liskey. In his childhood, B.J. was prone to fits of anger and violence. At school, he would often bully other children and get into fights. His parents believed that he would eventually grow out of this behavior, chalking it up to B.J. simply being a bad kid. But when they divorced in 1995, when BJ was 10 years old, things only got worse. He continued to get into fights and started skipping school. BJ lived with his father full time, and though we do not know much about his biological mother, we can only assume that she was not very present in his life following the divorce. When BJ was 15 years old, his father, Billy, met Susan Griffin at the local waste management company where they both worked. Susan, like Billy, was divorced. She had two children from her previous marriage, six-year-old Devin and 13-year-old Derek. The pair quickly fell in love, and just one year later, in 2001, they got married. Following the wedding, Susan and her boys moved into Billy and BJ's home. At first, the family seemed to be getting along well. Devin and Derek were accepting of the change and they formed a good relationship with their stepfather. But the same could not be said for BJ and his stepmother. Susan had rules for her sons when it came to things like behavior and chores, and she expected her stepson to obey them as well. But BJ, well, he was not the rule-following type. He started to resent Susan, and at the same time, his behavior worsened. Just one year into living with his new family, BJ threatened to harm himself. Billy called the police, but when they arrived, BJ attacked them. He was later charged in juvenile court for assaulting a peace officer but it is unclear what, if any, punishment was enacted. In 2004, BJ took one of the family cars without permission. When he came home, Susan confronted him. They got into a heated argument, yelling and calling each other names. In a sheriff's office report about the incident, Susan gave 
this statement. Quote, he screamed like a baby and called me more names and came at me full force. He hit me straight in the chest, somehow cut my eye. I tackled him down and told my husband to take him before I hurt him. BJ was not charged for the assault, probably because Billy and Susan did not want him to go to jail, where, by the way, things might have gotten much worse, meaning other prisoners would have beat him. This is not uncommon. Parents of the offender are very reticent to have the child incarcerated, especially in the early stages of the child being violent. They keep hoping things will get better. Lily Anderson, a Seattle-based clinical social worker, in an article about children abusing parents, says that, quote, many parents feel ashamed about their situation, and that could explain underreporting or parents not seeking support. She goes on to say, they don't want to tell their friends or their family members. They do feel a lot of self-blame around it. Like, I should be able to handle my child. I should be able to control this behavior. Just two months later, BJ's relationship with Susan and the rest of his family hit a breaking point. In December, he and Susan got into another argument. This time, he hit Susan with a coffee mug, stole her car keys, and tried to run away. He was arrested and charged with felonious assault and robbery and was supposed to stand trial for the charges. But after being evaluated by mental health professionals, he was found incompetent to stand trial. And by incompetent, I mean he was unable to cooperate with his defense attorney and he did not understand the charges against him. He was also diagnosed at that time with schizoaffective disorder, bipolar type. Psychology Today defines schizoaffective disorder as, quote, a thought disorder that includes both psychotic features, meaning out of touch with reality, hearing voices, seeing things that aren't there, as seen in schizophrenia, and mood symptoms that may be either depressive or manic in presentation. And by manic, I mean mania or hyperactive. There are two types of the disorder. One is the bipolar type, the other is the depressive type. They go on to say, unaddressed schizoaffective disorder can lead to difficulties with employment, school, and relationships. It frequently leads to substance abuse, isolation, homelessness, and even suicidal thoughts. It is quite possible that BJ was in a manic state when he attacked Susan, but he had not yet been properly diagnosed and treated. As such, things were going to get a lot worse. The case against him was dismissed, but soon after returning home, he attacked Susan again, this time while she was in the shower. At that point, BJ's father had reached his limit. He kicked him out of the house and he was placed in a group home. A group home is a residential establishment where many people suffering from a variety of illnesses can live safely and there are counselors and professional clinicians on site. During his time at the group home, BJ finally received treatment for his mental illness. He was given medication, but whenever he felt like he was getting better, he would stop taking it. He would also self-medicate with alcohol, and that usually made him violent towards others. It is very common for some mentally ill people to stop taking their medication, especially regarding the diagnosis we're talking about today, schizoaffective disorder. So exactly what is that? 
It is a type of thought disorder wherein the afflicted experiences difficulty perceiving reality correctly. Their cognition is altered and their thinking may encompass a delusion. Now, if you're a regular Killer Psyche fan, then you've heard me use that word before. So what exactly is a delusion? It is a powerful and usually unwavering belief in a concept or idea that has absolutely no basis in fact. For example, someone with BJ's diagnosis may wrongly believe that his parents are plotting to kill him when nothing could be farther from the truth. By the way, if you think you can talk someone out of the delusion, let me know how that works out for you. It cannot be done. The most serious obstacle someone with this disorder faces is their inability to even see that they have a mental disorder that negatively affects their ability to think straight, and therefore they cannot understand why they even need medication. And that is the same reason you cannot talk someone out of their delusion. They will merely think you're crazy or you're the enemy because you can't see the truth. They may also be suspicious of the medication they are told to take because it will help you. And so they stop taking it. In addition to being suspicious of the medication, many of those meds have side effects that are really unpleasant, including grogginess, blurred vision, significant weight gain, and dizziness. Not good. But BJ had another serious diagnosis. He was bipolar a serious mental illness that affects almost 6 million people in the United States, about 3% of the population. The medications most frequently used to treat this malady are called mood stabilizers, but they can have unpleasant side effects too, and about 50% of bipolar patients stop taking their meds. Unfortunately, the number one risk factor for relapsing into a bipolar episode is going off one's medication. Bipolar disorder is so serious that the life expectancy of someone with a serious mental disorder such as bipolar and schizophrenia is 10 to 20 years shorter than the general population. Not surprisingly, approximately 25% of bipolar patients have attempted suicide. And about half of all suicides in this country are attributed to bipolar disorder. So what exactly is it? Well, it is a very, very serious mood disorder, wherein the individual's mood or state of mind can and does swing from one end of the emotional spectrum, which would be joy, elation, grandiose thinking, racing thoughts, and hyperactivity, to the other end of the spectrum where they may experience persistent sadness, crushing depression, despair, and suicidal ideation. The happiness and elation end of the spectrum is frequently referred to as mania, or the manic state of the disorder, also called the high end. If you pay attention to crime stories in the news, then you hear the word bipolar a lot these days, probably because this malady can be linked to criminal behavior. And when it is, the story usually makes headlines such as a previous story we covered about an ICU nurse who, in a bipolar manic storm, drove through a busy intersection in Los Angeles driving 90 miles per hour. Three people were killed. In fact, according to the Journal of the American Medical Association Psychiatry, quote, the prevalence of convictions for violent crime among individuals with bipolar disorder was 8.4% in 
while that rate was 3.5% in the general population, more than twice as high, especially when the comorbidity of substance abuse is present. In 2006, when BJ was 20 years old, Billy filed for guardianship over his son in an effort to, quote, get him the help that he needs. Because BJ was an adult, he was responsible for his own medical decisions when it came to his mental health. But under a guardianship, his father could make those decisions on his behalf. When the guardianship was granted, Billy placed BJ into a halfway house. And for the next several years, he slowly tried to rebuild their broken family. Despite everything BJ did, despite every violent outburst, Billy just wanted his son to get better. Of course, as a loving parent, this is not at all surprising. He dearly loved his son. But what Billy did not know or see was that the little boy he loved, raised, and cared for was gone forever. And in his place was a seriously afflicted man with violent tendencies that were not going to go away. Not in this case, anyway. The only thing Billy did wrong was underestimate his son's illness and his capacity for violence. All the warning signs were there, and Susan was right to be fearful. I am aware of cases in which a psychiatrist warned parents that their adult child's illness was not only incurable, but that it was very dangerous for them to let that child into their home, that their son had delusions that the parents were out to get him, to kill him, and had voiced those fears as well as threats to kill them. I have heard of many, many cases in which someone, usually a male with this disorder, was in and out of treatment, sent home to live with the family member, went off his meds, and became violent. The police were called, and upon arriving at the scene, things went south, and someone ended up in the morgue. Sometimes the violent family member attacks or threatens the police, and they are shot and sometimes the cop is killed trying to defuse the situation. Hindsight being 2020, the only thing Billy and his family could have done to prevent this tragedy was relocate and not tell BJ where they were. And in every way, to me, that is the same as accepting that your child is lost and gone forever. And by the way, Delusions tend to last and last and last. So BJ's desire to kill them was not going away anytime soon. Billy spent as much time with BJ as he could and let him visit the family home on the weekends. But BJ was not allowed to spend the night. Susan still saw him as a threat, and while she tried to be supportive of her husband, she could not bring herself to trust his son. After a few years, it seemed like Billy's efforts worked. BJ did not get into any trouble with the law, and he did not get physical with Susan during that time. To keep this promising momentum going, Billy decided to take BJ on a hunting trip in October of 2010. After spending a week together at the family's cabin, they returned to the Liskey family home on October 30th. That night, Billy invited friends and neighbors over to have a few beers with him and BJ. One neighbor reported, quote, everyone had a good night, and that BJ's behavior was normal. As the house emptied out, Billy invited BJ to stay the night. Because he had been drinking, Billy decided against driving BJ back to the halfway house where he lived. Billy fixed up the living room sofa with pillows and blankets for BJ to sleep on, not knowing that he 
along with his wife and stepson, would be brutally murdered by BJ before the sun came up. One very fitting term that aptly describes the gruesome act that BJ committed is family annihilator, a devastating and horribly frightening act of violence that affects everyone associated with it in any way. Surviving family members, neighbors, employers, teachers, and especially clinicians working with the offender prior to the murders. Very early in my psychiatric nursing career, in fact, when I was a student nurse assigned to my clinical psychiatric rotation in the psych ward of a community hospital, I encountered a patient, a middle-aged man, who had killed his wife and two children. I first met him in the day room of the unit, and we began chatting. I was as green as green could be, but bursting with enthusiasm to employ the clinical skills I'd been taught regarding how to act and talk to a psychiatric patient. He was not my assigned patient. She was meeting with her psychiatrist, but while I was waiting for her, I began a conversation with this other patient, a man I'll call Jim. Jim actually spoke with me first, asking my name and why I was there. I introduced myself and told him I was a student nurse. We chatted about benign everyday topics, you know, you know, the weather, the local football team's recent win. He asked about the classes I was taking at the University of Illinois. As we sat in the day room sipping a cup of tea, I wondered to myself why he was a patient there. He seemed so normal. I finally asked him why he was in the hospital and he told me he, quote, needed to be in a safe environment. I assumed that meant he was suicidal. I was so wrong. In fact, this kindly gentleman had been assigned by the criminal court system to the unit for observation and treatment before being returned to jail pending his trial for murdering his whole family, wife and kids, while they slept. He was not suicidal. He was homicidal. He was a family annihilator and a seriously mentally ill one at that. That interaction took place in 1970, and to this day, whenever I hear of a story like the one we're discussing today, the Liskey family murders, I think of that man and the horrible consequences of untreated mental illness. In an article published by Science Daily, referencing a study of family annihilators published in the Howard Journal of Criminal Justice, there are four types of family annihilators, self-righteous, disappointed, anomic, and paranoid. Quote, disappointed. This killer believes his family has let him down or has acted in ways to undermine or destroy his vision of ideal family life. Susan came into BJ's life and, from his point of view, disrupted his relationship with his father. She implemented rules that he never had to follow in the household before. Or perhaps I should say there were rules, but he didn't follow them. Later, after his violent outburst, he is kicked out of his own home, separated from the place he used to share with just his father, and that was not ideal for him. But let me be clear, that is not why BJ killed his stepmother, Susan. Most kids have rules and regs and expectations. He killed her because he was compelled to do so because of his delusions and untreated bipolar mania. But this should not be surprising. From his point of view, Susan was really nothing more to him than an interloper who tried to control him. His own bio mom could not control him, and then she deserted him. 
So really, from my point of view and experience working with both adults and adolescents that had this diagnosis, Susan never had a chance with him. Any motherly or parental efforts to discipline him or place expectations on him were sure to be met with resistance and possibly violence. Even though he was diagnosed with a disorder in his early 20s, the onset of the illness was probably many years prior. Nevertheless, he rarely took his medication. His meds probably would have been a combination of mood stabilizers and antipsychotics, but of course, they have zero effect on the patient if they remain in the bottle or are thrown away, as many are. As such, and given his history of escalating violence, disaster was looming large in the Liskey household. His violent behavior was bound to escalate. So do all people with this disorder commit murder? No, 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 not at all. But research does suggest that people with both schizophrenia and bipolar disorder are responsible for a significant percentage of homicides in the United States, about 10%. And for mass killings, hold on to your hat. The percentage is a whopping 33%. Not surprisingly, the risk of perpetrating a violent crime is even higher for people with this diagnosis who also abuse substances, such as BJ was doing. That said, obviously there is no doubt BJ was severely afflicted by two profoundly disabling mental disorders, and this happened to him through no fault of his own. He did not bring it on himself in any way, such as drug abuse. He was born with this problem. So was BJ's highly disordered mental state the reason he massacred his family? Was it that simple, that cut and dry? Mental illness was to blame? Probably. Or could his decision to kill them have been guided by something else? something profoundly insidious and even darker and more sinister than his mental illness, something guided by pure, unadulterated hatred. Maybe, and if so, then the reason for the untimely demise of the Liskey family is a story as old as time. Revenge. With BJ in custody, investigators searched the family hunting cabin and his father's truck for more evidence. Inside the truck, they found blood stains and a 22 caliber rifle, which was later determined to be the gun used to kill Billy and Susan. Billy's wallet and phone were also found in the truck. On November 1st, 2010, BJ appeared in court. He, quote, appeared to not understand questions asked by the judge and had his public defender explain and answer questions on his behalf. BJ waived his right to a hearing and was sent to jail on a $3 million bond. He was also approved to go through a competency hearing to determine whether or not he could stand trial for his crimes. Months later, in March 2011, BJ called his biological mother from jail. During the call, his mother read him a newspaper article about the murders. When she asked him if he was responsible, he said, yes. As with all jailhouse phone calls, that conversation was recorded and it only further incriminated him. Soon after, a report by detectives in the case was released to the public. That report found that due to DNA evidence found on Susan's body, BJ likely sexually assaulted her before her death. The case against him was only growing stronger. 
But in August, after being found competent to stand trial, BJ pleaded guilty to all three counts of aggravated murder. In exchange for the plea, prosecutors recommended that he be sentenced to life without parole rather than the death penalty. In September of that year, BJ was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. At his sentencing hearing, he calmly addressed the court. Quote, I loved my dad very much, and it makes me feel sick every time I think about what I did. I can't really explain why this all had to happen, but I think most of all of it had to do with my mental illness. After the hearing, BJ's attorney told reporters that while his client was found legally sane, he was clearly mentally ill. The prosecuting attorney later said that the outcome was, quote, the best resolution of the case. He claimed that the evidence against Liskey was substantial enough to convict him in a trial, but due to his age and mental illness, the case would have been, quote, tied up in appeals for years to come. Less than four years into his life sentence, on March 31st, 2015, B.J. Liskey was found dead in his prison cell from a self-inflicted wound. Ross Correctional Institution officials investigated his death as a suicide, but the results of that investigation were not released to the public. He was 29 years old. From Wondery and Treefort Media, this is Killer Psyche. I'm your host, Candace DeLong. This episode was written and researched by Mary Chalenza and Jada Williams. Mary Chalenza is our series producer and Jada Williams is our associate producer. Mix and sound design by Matt Dyson and Aaron Bauman. Head of audio, Tom Monahan, with audio assistance from Masuzu Enaga. For Wondery, Yasmin Ward is our producer and Lizzie Bassett is our senior producer. Desi Blaylock is our managing producer and Callum Plews is our senior managing producer. The executive in charge of production for Treefort is Oscar Guido. Lastly, our executive producers are Kelly Garner and Lisa Ammerman for Treefort and Marshall Louis and Aaron O'Flaherty for Wondery. And last but not least, myself, Candace DeLong. The series is produced by Wondery and Treefort Media. 